Good evening, everybody. Happy Friday night. Happy cocktail night. How are you today? I'm coming to our place in the book where we left off last time. There we go. I've got it. Let me get this cracked open and ready for us. Speaking of cracked open and ready for us. Happy Friday, everybody. Kaz, happy Friday. Great to see you. Aileen, great to see you. Warm in Toronto. I wonder if Karen, you are there. Snowy. I couldn't believe that you wrote that on the Facebook group. That is just shocking. That is shocking. I am so sorry. That really is something, isn't it? Good Lord. From snowy Colorado. Linda, cheers, my dears. That's what I'm talking about. I've got some ice creamy white chocolate tangerine pale ale. Let's do it. Come on. I'm going to crack this open. Get ready for a signature slurp. Just kidding. Cheers, my dears. Happy Friday. It's good to see you all. Ah, it tastes like Budweiser, but it's fine. It's alcohol. It's fine. Aileen, great to see you. Linda H. April, good evening. Good to see you. And Teresa, cheers, my dears. Anita, cheers. Good evening. Happy Victoria Week. Is it Victoria Weekend? I remember we talked about this last year. God, isn't it scary how the time flies? Honestly, isn't it terribly scary? Mm. Joyce in rainy Pennsylvania, great to see you. Robin, great to see you. Cheers, my dears. Amy, great to see you in Virginia Beach. Happy hot Friday. That sounds better than snow, doesn't it? I mean, God, the variety is crazy. Cats Gallery, it's 4 p.m. Southern California, and it's a May gray day. I was going to say it's today, Friday the 13th. Last Friday was Friday. What is... We'll just leave that alone. We'll leave that alone. I'm far behind. Brushing the snow off the hummingbird feeders. God, that sounds like the title of a memoir. That's really poignant. I mean, poetic. Dave, great to see you. I knew you were going to have pizza. Pizza insider. Cheers, my dears. Let me give this another try. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. For what these, like, um, you know, what these beers cost, it's, it's, it's crazy, these fancy ones. But I do taste a little bit of ice cream and tangerine. I have to say, power of suggestion is powerful indeed. My first, my first impulse was Budweiser, right? So that's not so good because that costs a lot less. Mm. Okay, I'm going to go along with it now. It's getting better. Lisa, happy Friday in Pennsylvania. Great to see you. I've been, I've been so busy working on stuff. Um, I've got a really good show for tonight. And you know, we're going to continue our conversation about these classic rugs. We moved away uh, Monday and Wednesday, we looked at geometrics, and we're going to come back to that thought. But we have been, if you didn't catch the Monday and Wednesday episode of Coffee Time, we have been talking about uh, this book called American Classics. And it's called American Classics for a reason. These are rugs that were collected by um, the famous folk art collector, Barbara Johnson. Um, she collected many things, and rugs was one of them. And they are exquisite and beautiful and very, very, just fine, right? Really fine. Um, so I want to look at some other categories of rug that she collected. Uh, moving away from the geometrics for the time being, I want to look at some of the other rugs in her collection. But at the end, I got involved late this afternoon in this game that I made up for myself called If I Were Barbara Johnson, What Rugs Would I Be Buying Right Now? So at the end, I pulled uh, quite a few rugs off of, ge mostly geometrics, off of a very high-end website that are way out of my price range. But these are maybe the kinds of rugs that people, you know, of, of Barbara Johnson's ilk, this very sort of wealthy people, would be looking at as collectors. And we should talk about that when we get there because it's a, it's a game changer uh, the market is different than it was, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even 10 years ago. So we now have a situation online where there are a lot of online platforms, eBay, Etsy, um, all, live auctioneers, Auction Ninja, um, First Dibs, uh, Mercari, Ruby Lane. I mean, there's it's infinite, isn't it? The amount of platforms that support vintage and antique goods. And the thing about that, that's good and it's bad, is that it allows for people 
who have gotten a hold of, I put kind of a negative spin on it there, hook drugs, and they have no idea what they're touching or holding, which in itself is not a crime, is it? But when you start playing around on some of the higher end platforms and you think you're going to sell your rug that's a commercial pattern uh, that's not that old for a seven or eight thousand dollars, then it's like we're bordering on the screw loose territory, elevator stuck on the 99th floor territory. Once they were short of a picnic territory, uh, not the sharpest. To, I'm stopping, but you know what I mean? It's it's like a free for all at that point. So let's talk about that when we get there. But I think the fact that there are so many possibilities online for shopping and buying, we no longer necessarily have that middleman in place who formerly was like the guy at Sotheby's or the guy at Christie's. And he would say to you, "Uh, uh-uh, not what it is. Um, We're selling it, so we must stand behind it. We don't really have that anymore with these online platforms. Of course, online auction houses and big famous auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's still sell. They all charge an outrageous, um, um, what do they call it? Like not handling, but it's like, it's like the fee that goes to the house, right? You pay what you pay for the item and then it wants to charge you another large percentage on top that's often in the 30 percents, like 30 something percent, and then the shipping and handling if you're not there and tax. So it can often become like a really shocking amount of money when you thought you were picking up a $60 rug, right? So these are all things to consider, but we will still play that sort of game at the end where we look at some of the higher end rugs that are out there. I picked the ones that I thought were the most exquisite and that were certainly worthy of being bought, maybe not for the price that they are being, that's being asked, but worthy of being bought for sure. So let's get back into this mindset of looking at rugs that are old, that are lovely, that are probably not commercial patterns. That's going to be a case by case as we, as we go along. Buyer's premium, that's it. Thank you. And you know, that's one of those shape shifters, isn't it? It's like, what is that? What is that? Because the auction, don't get me started, too late. The auction house is char- is taking a huge cut from, I bring in this can, right? It's a collectible. You want it? Yes, we want it. Well, I'm going to, I get, what's my cut? Like 50%, 60%, maybe 40% and you get the rest. So you're charging me part of the cut and you're keeping it. And then you're charging a buyer's premium. On top of that, you get two different cuts from, and this is crazy. This is like some kind of weird uh, criminal spin that's been allowed to happen. And there's and the biggest auction houses do this too. It's not like it's just shady people. It's everybody does this. It's just one of these things that is allowed to happen lately. Like people trying to sell you wireless bras and telling you that your boobs are going to be okay. Well, they're not. They never will be in a, not, not mine. So, you know, we are in an age where people are constantly telling you, the way that it is, baby. And it's frustrating sometimes because it often makes no sense and there's no recourse, right? It's it's just the times we live in, these computer-driven times we live in. Let me take one more sip and then we'll get going. Mm. Sally, I didn't see you pop on. Happy Friday. Cheers, my dears. You know, this is where we left off. Let's, let's come back over here so we can refresh. I want to look at the last two rugs that we looked at really quick because these are going to play into today too. Remember this one? This is the second to last from Wednesday. This is the sort of light and shadow, quilt inspired, uh, very Amish looking. Not exactly a log cabin, but it certainly has the feel of, oh, Gail, great to see you. Good morning in Australia. Great to see you. So the reason that this does look like a um, log cabin quilt, I think, is because of the way that the shadows are running through it diagonally. That is very uh, typical and standard in this kind of an Amish um, rug. Tara, great to see you. You have been doing some amazing clam work with your, I noticed, um, to get that side to side stretch, those big knit, knitting needles running through that are kind of pulled to the sides with string or elastic. Very smart. I love to see, I love to see this kind of smartness. It is, uh, exciting. That's a huge you go girl. So, We were looking at that one and then we left off with this one. We had much to say on the subject of this rug because it was just over the top, wasn't it? This sort of compass rose feel, New York beauty in in quilting language, really exquisite. We talked about this uh, quite a bit. So I'm gonna move on from there um, to the promised next category of rug, 
uh, from the Barbara Johnson collection, which will be the floral and faux, F-A-U-X, um, at like the French word for false. I'm not sure what is, I, I don't, I don't know what a faux rug is. Uh, it could just be a category that was made up, just seat of the pants kind of thing. I'm not sure. So, um, oh, well, we will take you, Tara, for as long as you've got, we will take you. This piece is very pretty. You know, I always shy away from shaped rugs, even circle rugs. I don't know why. Um, I don't know why. I guess it's just a placement issue. I, I like, I, I put most of my rugs on the, on the wall and I always struggle with circles. Although I could see having a nice collection of circles or obviously chair pad type jobbies um, done circular like this, but this really is a pretty piece. If you notice, it is a circle and it because of those little points in the border, it has a bit of a starburst effect, doesn't it? And it's called Greek flower pot. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's distinctly not Greek to my eye. I, I understand that, that um, pattern on that little vase at the bottom, but that vase is not at all a Greek shape. So it's, you know, to me, it looks more like a sort of Native American type pottery thing. But uh, this piece is unofficially called Greek flower pot, take it or leave it, right? 1900 wool on burlap, 32 inches diameter, made in Lan Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Lisa, your neck of the woods. Um, it really is a beautiful piece. And many things that I, Susie, good to see you many things I like going on here. I do like the time that it took and the colors of putting in the very earthy colors into that little, looks more like a bowl to me. I, very unexpected. I really like the kind of tree branch um, composition. You know, it's a bouquet. It reads as a bouquet, but it looks more like a tree trunk. We did this quite a bit when we were doing our last design light class and we were talking about designing light quilts because we were looking at a lot of if you're familiar with them, Baltimore, Baltimore and Baltimore album quilts. And we were looking at individual blocks and I was making the point that when you are going to create a pattern, whether it's for quilting or for rug hooking, that has some kind of a flower pot, vessel, basket, something, you really want to be careful to put the skeleton of the little vines or stems in place first and then start to fool with the placement of the flowers, right? Particularly if you're doing it very graphic, very art deco, like this Greek bouquet is, we're gonna look at it again. But you really wanna get that skeleton in place because if you don't have that skeleton in place, it's really likely that the bouquet turns into pig's breakfast bouquet. So you really want to have that sort of network or grid in the background of your stems. And, and that forces you to think about things in terms of What's going on in the center? Because if you've worked or if you've tried to design florals, that is always the question. What is going on in the center? Do I, you want symmetry, right? With rug design, particularly if you're doing like primitive style, traditional, you do like the symmetry. You feel it ought to be there somehow. But the question comes immediately, do I have one big fat flower in the front? Do I have two flowers stacked on top of each other? Because we know that things in, in twos or in even numbers typically won't work well. They're just not as interesting. What do you do? How do you solve these problems? The best way to solve this problem is to drop your uh, stems in first, and then you fool with it. Just cut out little bits of paper, printer paper. Just put them in there and see how it would work. Now, this piece kind of defies that um, instruction, right? As much as I say it's very important to do that, the person who designed this did not do that. They said to themselves, I want a lot of flowers because I want a lot of pretty colors. And they didn't think about, well, do I want a black sort of tree trunk in the front with lots of intersections of stem showing? You know, in this composition, it really does work. Somehow that geometry, those diagonals are playing off of this, the very subtle starburst, off of all of those green leaves that are shaped beautifully as a unit and off of the diagonals in that vase. So somehow it is working, but it is a complete fluke um, because looking at this piece, it would work, I think, just as well if, for example, there was one more flower in the front hiding some of that skeleton. But I'm fine with it. It, it. it is very naive. It's very folky. It has a real feel to it. I love seeing that black stem because it does mirror the vase in the border. 
Um, somehow it works, but not by design, by luck. Wendy, great to see you. Oh, you did make it tonight. Cheers, my dears. I'm having a little sip to celebrate you coming on. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the things I really like about this composition, there are a lot of unresolved issues here, right? What I love, the color, the shapes, really simple. It looks like somebody was cutting out pieces of paper and just layering flowers on thinking, when you have a bouquet, there's a lot of flowers. I can't show them all flat. We do in rug hooking, but this person probably didn't have 1900, the year, that kind of reference point, right? That kind of comparison to make. So they're thinking, must be lots. I better layer a whole bunch. And they seem to have repeated some shapes, which is always charming. Multiples are very strong in, in terms of composition. Things I love about it, the changes of color with these leaves, the light mint, the spearmint, they're all very cool colors of green, aren't they? But they're different. And then that really wacky kind of um, key lime green on the top in a couple of the leaves really brings your eye up there, keeps it moving. I like the white, the contrast of very bright purples, pinks, red, maroon, sort of aubergine eggplant, but then white and very light pink. I don't know what the fade situation is on this, but it really is a nice combination of colors. It's a nice blend. Um, I also like the unresolved issues, like those big round sort of ring flowers do not come all the way around. There are definitely petals missing. They do not resolve themselves. You don't see the other half of them. Typically, that would be hugely problematic looking at a piece, but for me, and each of us see differently, right? For me, it's okay. I, I see what's going on. I see that there's some unresolved stuff with those ring flowers, but ha you know, having recognized that, I still feel that the, the good things that are going on in this piece really, really outweigh the things that are questionable. It is a lovely, really lovely, charming, uh, very naive piece. And again, I'll say it again in case you missed the earlier episodes um, of this subject. These are all public domain, not even public domain. These are all copyright free because of their age, right? So if you see something that you love, you should get right on it and do it. Absolutely. Hey, Becky. Oh, I'm glad you made it. Good evening to you. Happy Friday. Oh, uh, so this one, this is kind of a bad photograph to begin with. This piece is called Dove Garland. What a really lovely piece, isn't it? This is getting more toward the promo gown look. This is 1910. Promo gown starts working in the 1920s. So this is a little bit earlier. Nothing to do with her. It just, this very lush uh, repeat border of leaves is not the way that she would handle a border, but you can see the sort of evolution of design that's happening here. Almost this kind of uh, religious motif of the doves with the branches. Really, really lovely sort of dove of peace reference. In this case, it's very decorative, and it seems to cross over to, at that time, contemporary uh, wallpaper design, right? You see a lot of paper design in old historic houses that look something like this. Um, very limited color palette, but really elegant fine use of lights and darks and shadows and shading, right? For for people who do love the sort of promagown school of shading, that traditional, how you're taught, very romantic, absolutely perfect word, um, how you're taught to shade each part of every leaf. This is before that, and yet it's really working, isn't it? I mean, it's really working. It's For me, it's very limited. Um, this would be one that I wouldn't I wouldn't lose sleep over personally because it doesn't have um, the kinds of crazy, oh, Joan, great to see you, the kinds of crazy colors that I go for personally. But you could see how this could be such a lovely atmospheric piece over like a big buffet, nice antique buffet kind of furniture piece, how this could even be in the living room and be super elegant. Um, it is like a moment in time piece. It echoes book illustration, book plates, things like that. Uh, 1910 wool on burlap, 98 inches by 32 inches from Pennsylvania, the X Wyeth collection. That's all it says. So I'm guessing it is the Wyeth family. I don't know if it's father, son, or grandson, but I'm guessing it is the, the famous Wyeths that we're talking about. This piece is also from the Wyeth collection, and it's referred to as Wyeth Rose. I wish I knew more about this in particular because we talk about the Wyeths often, and we talked about them last Friday bingo night. We talked about N.C. Wyeth. Anyway, Sue's good to see you. So Wyeth Rose dates to 1890. This is an earlier rug. We're into the 19th century here. Wool and cotton rag on burlap, 63 by 35. Now, isn't it interesting that so many of the rugs that we've been seeing this week looking at these cla American classics, 
they are not hearth rugs. I mean, isn't that interesting? Now, why do you think that is? And this is like, this is, I'm just putting this out there to you. I don't know the answer. But the fact that so many rugs from the 19th century, original rugs, were made to sit at the hearth. It's, it's very curious to me that there are not a lot of hearth-shaped rugs in this book. I can't think of any so far. It might be that we're about to encounter some. Um, but these are all like room size, much larger rugs. And I just wonder from a collecting point of view if Barbara was more of the mind of like, you know, bigger is better. I would like the larger ones. I'm not really looking for um, the very sort of, um, um, I don't know. I don't want to put down the hearth rug, right? Because they were often very, very simple and very similar patterns to the neighbor. So maybe less original, unique, maybe less maybe thought to be less artistic. I feel that they are equally artistic. But I don't know the answer to this question. I'm just pointing it out because it is a curiosity to me that these are none of these that we've been seeing are hearth rugs. And that is the largest category of rug from the early period, the 19th century and early 20th century. This one is 63 by 35 inches, uh, from formerly from the Wyeth collection and found in Pennsylvania. So it went from the Wyeths to Barbara Johnson. Uh, and then, incidentally, um, from what I found out uh, since Wednesday, these rugs were auctioned in 1994 at Sotheby's. I think it was Sotheby's. So not all of them, some of them. It's hard, it's hard to tell past auctions that are that um, long ago. It's not documented super well. It is something that one could find out. But that at least gave me a, a year, right? Um so I thought that was interesting. The Wyeth Rose is a it is a really interesting composition. It is a bit clunky, isn't it? Not to put it down because it is lovely. I love the geometric in the background. I always liked a, a, a tipped grid in the background, right? Say that 20 times. Now, the thing is, you've got this fine coloration in the back. And then, yeah, I love the rose too, Sally. You've got the one rose. I mean, it's so particular, isn't it? Um, Tara, would do you find this one romantic as well? I'm, I'm just wondering because it's so, I wonder if it was made for a marriage, right? If there is some, the red rose obviously signifies love. Um, Karen says, I wonder if hearth rugs got too dirty with ash or burnt a little. You know, we had this conversation a while back, like a year ago, because there was a big conversation. We were talking about, um, the earliest floors, colonial American floors and what they looked like, what they were made out of and what they evolved into over the decades. And one thing that came up was we tapped into a book, and I'm never going to think of it off the top of my head, where somebody who had done an extraordinary amount of academic work and research said these hearth rugs were put down in front of the hearth, but they were not kept there when the fire was happening. Because the conversation came up, well, the rug would have been better if sparks were flying than a spark hitting the bare floor and setting the house into a torch. But this person said, we'll have to figure out what episode that was, but she was very specific and she said of the hundreds of hearth rugs that she's seen, she's only seen one that had any evidence that a spark ever hit it and a spark would hit them. So her, again, I'm referencing a show from probably a year and a half ago, um, but it was such a curious thing to read that and to find that out because she, you know, she had looked at a, a vast number of rugs and taken a very thorough survey and found that there really was no evidence except on one kind of lone wolf rug that somebody had had it in front of the fire. So I don't think so. I don't think so. When I think of hearth rugs, I tend to think of the same kinds of designs again and again. And so far, they aren't the kinds of designs that Barbara collected. So it could just be that she shapes her collection after her personal interests, as you always should as you always should, because if you're collecting for financial reasons and then the bottom falls out of the earth as it looks like it's about to, God forbid, your investment's gonna be worth nothing. You might as well be crying into a rug that you really love, right? That you didn't buy as an investment, but that your heart loves and cannot live without. Um, and I think that's the way that Barbara collected. Um, well, it, it it, I mean, it gets, it, yeah, it can burn. But we were saying in that episode, someone who is more knowledgeable than I am on this subject was saying, well, it would still be better for, um, I'm going to stay here for a minute on this one. It would still be better for the floor if it hit the rug rather than the floor, right? Particularly in those days when if you didn't have the plaque, the fireman's plaque on your, on your um, house, 
and your house was one giant torch, they wouldn't service your house. They wouldn't put the fire out if you didn't have the plaque that showed you were kind of um, in the club and paid for the service of having the fire extinguished. Um, but yeah, we'll have to go back to that episode and back to that information because I still have all that stuff. Um, Sally says, I'm going to master the morning glory before I attempt a rose. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea at all. The rose can be a bit clunky because you've got all of these folded in petals, right? It's, I mean, that's what makes it so lovely is the sort of shy quality of it. It's like this little tight bud of all of these little, little petals, so silky and velvety and soft, all tight up together. Um, but it is hard to hook. It is hard to hook. And there really isn't shading done on this one. There's a real, um, for me, disconnect between how natural and fine the geometric part of it is versus the rose. And again, for an 1890 rug, there would be absolutely no information out there at all about how to shade a rose. It would be dec it would be 50 years before, oh, the song The Rose, isn't that a great song? You know, I just listened to that the other day on my um, USB stick. So nice. Um, you know, it would be years before people started putting out books that showed you 20 numbers on every rose petal, you know, what color it was supposed to correspond to. So going out on a limb and doing a piece like this was really brave and bold and um, brave again. Now this piece is called Blue Snowflake. It looks much darker. I'm guessing it was a navy. This picture is not bright, but I didn't want to mess with it too much. I brightened it up already a little bit. It's almost the same year as the Wyeth Rose. This is 1900 wool and silk on burlap. 36 by 26, so um, a bit of a smaller size, more toward like a welcome mat size, but not that not that long, wide um, hearth rug type of size. This one found in Ohio, um, and it says a few places where it was seen. Now, this one, Ohio, but it does have that Penn Dutch feel, and why shouldn't it, right? It could be the same sort of communities, the same kind of inspiration. This is the kind of a design. Now, picture this when you're looking at it. This is a quarter design, right? If you took the quilt class with me, this isn't a half design, this is a quarter design. If you were to fold your paper into quarters and draw the center of this blue snowflake out with that one, um, you know what, I'm taking that back. It is a half design because of the direction of the bows, right? It could, if they were coming from the corners, it would be a quarter design, but this is a horizontal half design, right? A horizontal. Interesting. Isn't it fun to identify what kind um, of design it is because it, that tells you exactly how this was drawn and how it was made. Very simple. Could be that the center was a paper cut. Everybody loves that song, right? We all love that song. We should make our own song list if we can. Can never play songs during these videos, though, because of what happened at Christmas. Remember, not last year, I think, but the year before I did like the Christmas um, countdown, like best, you know, most popular songs of the years. And then I got in all kinds of trouble. We won't do that again, but we should make a playlist that we can listen to on our own. Mm. Very limited color palette here, but I think this is a super effective design. I would love to see this design done in different colors. I would love to see not such a dominant dark snowflake. I would love to see it reversed um, with kind of a mottled, unexpected, blues, light blues, lilacs background, and then the white snowflake. I would love to see that. Wouldn't mind having those flowers present as poinsettias for a winter rug, but I would love to see the colors reversed on this. It is lovely the way that it is, um, but I, I just, my brain immediately wants to reverse it. Now, this is a real beauty. Um, 1885, an earlier rug called, and again, these are not the official names. These are the names of the rugs while they were in the Barbara Johnson collection. Happy wreath. Wool yarn on burlap. So we tend to see wool yarn when we get more toward Canada. This rug happens to have been found in Massachusetts, right? But you do get more 100% yarn, not wool strip rugs, the further north you go in general, in general for this time. I love rugs with perfect symmetry. Susie, they are good, aren't they? Now looking at this one, this is a vertical half, right? If you folded this in half, you would vertically get the same thing. And this helps us understand how to design and it encourages us, I hope, to know that designing can be easy. It is easy. There are only so many tricks. The tricks are finite. You figure out what they are and you, you choose which ones you wanna play with and then you play and you get stuff like this. If people could do this in 1885, you can certainly do this now. 
found in Massachusetts 44 by 22, a Waldboro type, meaning, as we know, it's, it's sculpted, like the surface is sculpted. So we can't really see it in this photo, and this is the photo from the book, but at least some of these flowers, if not more of it, is three-dimensional, is raised. And how is that done for beginners? That's done by hooking very, very, very densely and then clipping it back like a little bonsai tree, right, with very sharp scissors, rounding it, sculpturing it like a modern Aubusson type rug, right? Yeah, yarn, Aileen says, glad to see yarn in something traditional. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yarn makes just as fine a rug as anything else does, silk, wool, anything. It is nice to see it. And you do get color changing yarn too. You're seeing bits of it here. I can see some parts that are certainly changing color before my eyes. Um, Yarn is a great, a great way to get into rug hooking. I say that to everybody who's starting out. Another nice old piece. Now this piece is very old. It says that it's 1850. Now from the reading, the most recent reading and writing that is done on rug hooking, the earliest we can get is 1860. So I don't know. This collection is from the 1880s, right? And coming out of the 70s, we were still saying that rug hooking was Egyptian. So as we learn more, as we um, study more rugs and how they are made and more time and more importantly, more money is put into this kind of scholarship, we learn more and more as time goes on. There wasn't a lot of study done on hooked rugs, um, you know, in the middle to late 20th century. We're seeing more of that now, more money heading toward the folk arts. Um, including rug hooking, but it says 1850. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say if this is 1850, it's the first rug. Um, so I don't know about that date. I think we should, we should slide it a little bit backward, but it is a lovely piece that's entitled Tinsel Picture. Have you seen these beautiful foil, metallic foil pictures, Victorian era in antique stores? I think the reason it's probably dated the way that it is, is because it's like tinsel pictures are from this era. So if somebody was inspired by looking at a tinsel picture that they had made or somebody had made for them and they copied the composition this way, it gets the name and it gets uh, the subsequent date. Uh, wool sheared on linen. Okay, so that's a game changer. Did you hear that one? I hadn't read this before. Wool, sh uh, not sheared, shirred. I'm going to say it like that because it's S-H-I-R-R-E-D. Coming to you with a lot of skin right now. It was just too hot. Um, so this is, this is a bit of an oxymoron, right? Now that we caught this, now it makes sense. It could date to 1850 because the shirred rug is earlier than the hooked rug. We know that for sure. We know that for sheer. Um, so a shirred rug me is sometimes called a caterpillar rug. It means that you're scrunching up a piece of wool, um, ruching it, right? And then you're sewing it on with a needle. So it's not actually a hooked rug. So the hook drugs of Barbara Johnson, there's at least one in here that is not a hook drug. It is a needle made rug. And for that reason, I can't accept that as a date. That fits in perfectly. It's very hard to discern between shirred rugs, any kind of sewn rug, and a hook drug without looking at the back and without having those basic tools in place. Like your eye already knows what to expect from the different forms. Karen says, been dyeing wool yarn all day for the big project I've designed for after my current project. Ooh, I don't know if I know that one, Karen. Have I seen a glimpse of that one yet? And Gail says, I'm happy about yarn as it's hard to get wool in Australia. Absolutely. And it doesn't even have to be wool yarn, does it? It can just be yarn. Uh, it can be any yarn. You know, it depends on how hard wearing you need it, where the thing is gonna go in the end. But people have hooked for decades with acrylic yarn from Joann's and Michael's and perfectly happy with that. So, you know, yarn is, yarn is a contender for sure. Tinsel picture um, was made by Mrs. Stevenson in Edenton, Vermont. Now that's the first time that we've had that specific a reference in one of our rugs from this book. So very, very nice, very handy to see that. I love the simplicity of this piece. It's, it is a real kind of toss, right? The flowers are just kind of tossed out there. It is, it is lovely, it is delicate. Um, it is very sweet, very sweet piece. I'm going to speed through a little bit more. Now, wait a minute. What did I, did I do that? Hold on one second. Well, that just reminded me my mom's not on tonight. Gosh, now I'm going to get nervous wondering what she's up to. Okay, so here's another one. Navajo, 1930, wool on burlap found in Maine. Well, that's interesting because we know, I mean, there are, there was a um, this sort of mission, right? That was Helen Albee. That was in New Hampshire. I know there was another one, the Maine Mission Rugs, 
um, I didn't think that they tended to do Native American inspired designs. Um, so this could actually be a Helen Albee design, or it could be a main mission rug, or it could just be a one-off from someone else, because at this time, 1920s, 1930s, right, it kind of ends abruptly at that point, Pearl McGowan has a bit of a renaissance with these sort of American ethnic designs, like the Americas, um, but they're, they definitely fade out in popularity after the, the missions, the Maine mission, the New Hampshire mission, all of those mission years, um, particularly with Helen Albee in that immediate part of the country doing designs that were inspired uh, by Native American designs. But we also know from our talk last week or the week before that Navajo rugs were making their way to the East Coast in great numbers. It could just be that somebody sitting around copied a rug or a rug that they remembered from a neighbor, thought it was pretty, couldn't afford one, and copied one. Impossible to know because um, I don't recognize this pattern as it is, but interesting and something when we have infinite time that we could chase. But in the meantime, it is an unusual rug for her collection because it is not, it does not fit in with the style of her other rugs. And having said that, here comes another kind of anomaly of a rug. Doesn't this look just like an Emily Carr rug? I mean, it really does. It does make me wonder, is this an Emily Carr rug? Uh, she always went for these um, sort of indigenous people, Canadian tribal um, totem designs, right? This was all this is, this is what she did uh, with her rug hooking. So if, I don't know if you've caught the Emily Carr episode, C-A-R-R, -R, that I've done in the past. We've talked about her a lot. What she doesn't typically do is corner designs. So when I look at this and I see the corner designs, it makes me think it's probably not an Emily Carr. Another thing she doesn't typically do is break up the background in this manner. If you can picture, she's only got a, maybe four or five rugs that she hooked that we know of. And I'm not saying this this can't be her. Um, because she does a lot with outlining, but there's a couple technique things that are going on here that don't ring exactly true, which means it could certainly be someone else or could, oh, hi, Barb. It could certain, oh, Robin, look, and Kaz, another buddy from Wisconsin. Um, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to come back to this one and see if maybe it's, it's from New York. It was purchased in New York. That's all that's said on it. Not where it was originally from. It's called a Dorst. Right, um, I don't really get the reference, and I don't know this word, adorced. Um, unexpected, right? This is maybe a to be continued for a rainy day project. I would like to know more about this. It does, you know, some when I look at that middle sort of totem, that horizontal with the sort of dragon, the, the tongue sticking out, that looks less like Emily Carr to me. Also, the eagle seems to have like breasts. Who knows what that's about, but interesting. Beautiful coloration, though. Beautiful coloration. Not as bright as I would think for Emily Carr. To be continued. Let's say to be continued because um, there's quite a few things here. Now that I'm looking at it, we're looking at it together that are curious to me. Now, this is a really different one. This is a much newer one, 1940. You always have to love. Maybe this is why they called this chapter partly faux. Okay, I think I got it. Don't you think? Oh, hey, Donna. Donna says, looks very much like uh, Haida Indian carvings of British Columbia. You know, I know that you know better than I with, with this kind. Let me come back to that picture. Um, I know we've, we've, um, you've, you've mentioned this style to me before, and I have not researched it, and I still need to. But I know that you know, you, you're, I'm defaulting to your superior knowledge for sure. Um, so if you are interested in this rug and you're watching, this might be something to check out. Check Dinah's comment in the thread there. That is an interesting lead, and I, I know that that's a solid lead coming from Donna. So I think the reason they're calling this chapter uh, in part faux is like faux as in Trump Loy, but also faux rugs like the Navajo was not a real Navajo rug, was it? And we're about to touch base with like a um, um, Chinese rug, right, which is not Chinese. So maybe that's where the faux comes in. Interesting. Bookcase 1940, wool, all wool on burlap, found in Connecticut. And it was made by Orton Jones Studio. Orton Jones Studio. I do not know Orton Jones Studio. I'm going to fox this page because 1940, Orton Jones Studio, something I want to research. 92 by 25 and a half. Interesting. It's not like, it's, it's not a change my life rug, but man, would I love to see this in the upstairs hall that sort of trump -loy look. It's very simple. It's very lovely. I know my buddy Judy Taylor did a, a book rug that I am obsessively in love with, like like criminally in love with. 
Um, Tara says, Donna, I think you're right. Donna's, Donna's good at making these calls, really good at making these calls. So interesting, what an easy one to hook to, the faux books. Now you could put your favorite book titles on there, right? Whatever they are, you could, on the larger spines, do, it depends on the scale of the piece too, but you could do some lovely, um, you know how spines of older books are just so glittering and gold and beautiful. It would be something to think about. I'm going to zip along a little bit because I have so many more things I want to show you. This certainly falls into the category of faux. Now I understand. Light dawns on marble head. Chinese connection. It's called 1920. Fine wool yarn. There we go. Clipped to form pile on coarse cotton, knotting an end fringe from base fabric. So what they might have done with their foundation fabric is just after they finished the hooking part, secured it, tied it, sewed it, whatever, to make sure it didn't unravel and then just unravel the foundation material. You see people do that a lot. It's a smart way to get a fringe. Oh, the hook in yesterday. I loved seeing the Heart of Wisconsin hook in photos. Those were just absolutely beautiful. This piece called Chinese Collection Connection was found in New York. So now I'm, I really am getting it, right? This all makes sense that Barbara would have been collecting uh, rugs that were considered faux, copies of other culturally other rugs, right? Now, coming back to a real full blast American rug, this one is so different. Natural velvet, it's called. It's velvet, velveteen, and corduroy on burlap. That's quite a lineup, isn't it? 1940. So this isn't an, as old a rug as I think it looks like at first blush, but what does this rug have going for it? It's got a very united color palette, doesn't it? I mean, it's not my color palette, but I mean, it's blacks, reds, oranges, and browns, and a little bit of blue. Really interesting and different color palette. It's got something going, I mean, it certainly looks like um, either, I, I, would, I would gun for a um, original pattern, but if it is a commercial pattern, it wasn't done exceedingly well, was it? It's very graphic, maybe on purpose, done in, more sort of art deco, very graphic style. But I don't really believe that because unless this rug is on the diagonal in terms of the grain, it is much harder to hook diagonals. And the whole background, the, you know, more than half of this rug is the background. Those are all diagonals, that's hard. It has a beautiful woven kind of a plaid look, doesn't it? Lots of lights and darks shot through that background. Really, really different. There is something very innocuous and unknown about that center. Read into it what you will, right? Um, these echoes of color in the center, a little bit confusing. Um, I would almost prefer to see a year or something in there, but who's asking me, right? Who cares? This rug is from 1940. It's very different. I'm very drawn to it because of these different, the, the way that it's tipped to the diagonal. And the centers of some of these flowers are just big, fat centers, lots of sort of simple poppies, simple. But it does have something, doesn't it? It has that je ne sais quoi, that, that undefinable, can't put my finger on it. It's dramatic, Tara. It is dramatic. It really is different. I don't know that it's stunning, but it really is different. And I would expect it to be more like a 19th century rug, and it's a 1940 rug. Um, interesting, made in New Jersey. Now, we're coming into the section on beasts and birds. So this is a beast, I guess. Here's Roy, 1970, right? So this is a much later edition for Barbara. This is a 40-inch diameter rug, wool rayon, uh, with a huge and gorgeous braid around the edge. Really gorgeous, beautiful primitive center found in New Hampshire. The pig was hooked with rayon taken from an earlier rug. Okay, so the, the center is an earlier part. The background hooked with wool. And then it was inset, uh, the earlier braided rug was inset, but mistakably sewn to back, sewn to back. Not, I'm not really getting the language there, but it's obviously um, a hooked rug that has had the addition of a really glorious braided border. And it is beautiful, it works well. We see this a lot online. One of the perks of being online, right, and, and suffering all of the indignities of being online, is that you get to see great examples of these kind of uh, crossover rugs, those, these mutants that combine more than one uh, technique. And there is nothing more natural in the world than having a hooked rug with a braided border. The color change from the center out to that kind of celadon green, sagey green color um, continued through the first two rounds of color in the braid. 
and then switching to the ochre with black and then finally just the solid black really smart really good color sense super lovely and roy is adorable here's an earlier rug 1880 stag wool and cotton rag on burlap 38 by 33 found in eastern pennsylvania really beautiful rug so different we know that the stag is one of the great motifs um, of the late 19th, early 20th century. Very well sort of articulated head. Uh, probably a lot of fading and color loss because I'm guessing that the stag uh, was more, the color was a bit more consistent originally. I love the rack. I love the way that the points are, are, are really well done. Just a nice simple face, but the, the placement of the eyes is great. When you have eyes that are not placed right, like that you get one and it's not it's more toward the snout than it should be, or it's more up near the ear. It can become very confusing. The body on this stag is quite well done. Right? It looks a little bit like a lamb's body. There's a, there's, there's a little bit of too much straightness to it and too much roundness, but it is a very shapely body, and, and the face is done real well. The rack is done real well. I love the way that the trees, it was kind of like how to do it, right? How to deal with the trees. Very natural color trunks on the trees, and then they did just what I was describing earlier, the maker, and they hooked the skeletal branches, right? They got the branches in there first, and then they said, look at all this negative space. Wonder what to do. I don't really have any colors that fit the trees. And they just went with a continuation of the hit or miss colors. Now, this, this is true scrapping, isn't it? This is thrifty scrapping. They had just more hit or miss, and so that's what they used. I mean, don't you love seeing this kind of philosophy employed in these early rugs? It is just what we look for, and it's just what we live for. Um, Cass says, I like how the person did the black outlines. It definitely helps. Those black outlines must be there with a background as busy as this. And you would think using the same hit or miss colors at, to make up the body of the tree, you would think that would become very confusing and unsuccessful, but weirdly, it's feathery and lovely, and it really, really works. Oh, you've already met each other. How nice. Oh, how nice. Very good, the stag, isn't it? Very nice early rug. Now, here's a different one. Tara, don't look too close, right? You're going to get the heebie-jeebies. Nice horse called Cleopatra 1930, wool and rayon on burlap, 44 and a half by 33, made in Connecticut. That's all we know. That's all she wrote. Very simple design, and maybe Cleopatra because of the hairstyle, right? Can't you see that? That real graphic just drop, that sudden drop of hair, you know, cascade. The tail isn't handled in the same way, but it is different. I think that's a great name for this piece. Very, very bulky fence in the background, but it creates a good solid geometric. Someone had a lot of white. Somebody liked making that very solid um, white fence in that very round sun sweet. Somebody had a lot of blue. I don't know if they got involved in dyeing or what, but they did real well. A little bit of sort of veining, a little bit of marble cake on the horse. It looks fantastic. Look at that little eye. Look at the little upturned mouth, a little bit of a smile. Doesn't look like he really wants to kill you. And then the real prestige of this piece for me, unexpected, very shallow, very thin, hit or miss border. And it, more than hit or miss, it has more of a crazy quilt feel, doesn't it? I mean, really blocked out crazy quilt. It is so different. It is so different. We should be looking at borders like this is inspiration. I don't feel personally like the border fits the rug perfectly, um, but I like it. I'm, I'm not big on animal rugs myself. Um, and I also feel the same way about horses. I'm scared to death of them. But all the same, um, I love I love the border. I would love to see this border again on many different kinds of compositions. Just very pretty. I'm speeding up a little bit because I have so many things I want to show you. Um, these guys are a lot less intimidating to me. Ethel's Chickens, 1972, the year I was born. Wool and synthetics on burlap, right? Synthetics are okay. Don't let anybody tell you anything else. 35 by 20 inches made by Ethel Bishop grandmother of Dr. Robert Bishop, who's the direct, who was the director of the Museum of American Folk Art in New York City. Interesting. Ms. Bishop was 91 when she made the rug from, an old, from old thrift store clothing. Isn't that fantastic? What a great simple composition, right? You just cut out a chicken, trace him twice. What are the chances he's going to come out identical both times? It's pretty much zero, isn't it? He's a little different. The chicken is a little different both times. 
Um, I love the I love the combs. Is that the comb on the top of the head? Really neat. I love the red. The same red as in the border. Very simple. Um, patterned. A patterned fabric was used in the background, right? It's not a huge rug at uh, 35 by 20. So somebody had an excessive amount of something, maybe a blanket, but it made a lovely patterned ground. I love the way that the eyes are handled as well. Just a little bit of that black outline and then those colors to separate where the feathers would be in the tail. Different colors for each of the birds. I think really, really charming. Very simple. Simple little touches and you're there, right? Very, very folky. Oops. Now, more birds. Now, these guys are ducks, and this one is called Via Pumpkin Patch, 1890. Wool and cotton rag on burlap, 40 inches by 26, also found in Connecticut. So neat. Multiples, right? Multiples. And what happens in the background here? Do they run out of the dark, or are they trying to uh, create a situation that looks like the, the ducks are going to the water? Probably ran out. Or possibly it was all dark and some of it faded. One particular material faded. Who knows, right? This is something that science could figure out, but not us by looking at a flat photo. It is a lovely um, motif in the center. Notice how they didn't frame out or do a black border around that central motif. It's just like, here's the picture and here's the border. And see how the border is very irregular. That I find that so charming. Down at the bottom, oops, two reds next to each other. Are we going to cry ourselves to sleep? Let's not. Let's just go with it. This is folk art. This is proper folk art. Very well done uh, little bodies here, right? Sweet, uh, very likable image, right? The, the mother uh, duck with the baby, so they're little, little webbed feet. It's very likable, and the border really is a very heavy primary color-driven composition. But I like how the, the diamonds or the flying geese or whatever you want to call this diagonal border, I like how it's not perfect. That really adds to the charm if this is indeed 1890, it is an early rug, and it has done well. It has fared well. I would love to see the backs of these rugs, but we don't get that in this particular book. We'll have to chase up where they actually are. Let's look at this next one. We are still in our animals. This is called M-A-D Cats. M period A period D period Cats. 1885 wool rug on burlap. 44 and a half by 25 and a half. Made in Rhode Island, the biggest little state in the Union. So... Um, lion on the floor, American hook drugs. Oh, there's references to places and catalogs where this rug has appeared in the past. So I don't know why it's called M period A period D. Maybe does, does that stand for something other than, well, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. We need another D. We're missing that. I don't know. Maybe they just look mad. Um, it is punctuated very well. So I absolutely love this piece. I don't know about you. I love this patchwork ground. It's very simple. It seems like maybe they drew the cats a little bit too high in the oval and thought, uh -oh, and had to do something to fill that space. And they did a noble job of getting those beautiful colors into this patchwork situation. It makes it look like the little cats are right on the edge of the bed, about to have the kind of a brawl that ends in tails sticking up and diagonal running through the house in crazy five minutes, right? It looks like we're on the, br the bridge of that kind of a moment. Beautiful colors, and this really is a marble cake background. Somebody just dropped in, and it is hit or miss, right, because the colors vary, just reaching the hand into the rag bag and pulling something out, using it. Really warm um, colors for this sort of marble cake background. Lots of contrast, very unexpected blocking and breaking down, but almost like somebody just took the color at hand and just ran it in any direction they wanted as long as they could and then did the one next to it the same way. And then they got to places where we have a lot of up, updo, right, and downdo. And then on the side, they're kind of blocking it in and coming to shapes in the center as they block in. This is how you do marble cake. This is one of the best examples of marble cake I've ever seen for myself. Um, really, absolutely um, rewarding is a great word, Susie. It really is gorgeous, that motion. Um, it's so unique. You couldn't do this, could you? I mean, you would have to really labor to study, well, the next one should be red, the next one should be mustard, the next black. I mean, it would really be a thing uh, and probably not a fun thing to try to recreate a rug like this because it is so spontaneous and that is the joy in looking at it. That is the prestige. Um, let's see. Beautiful bear hair. This is called Pink 
Bear, 1910, woolen cotton on burlap, 33 by 23 found in Chicago, Illinois, one of a number of unusually colored animals in the Barbara Johnson collection. So who knows, maybe that was one of her sort of niche um, collecting ideals was having like odd cuddle, odd, oddly colored animals, right? When you collect and you can afford to collect what you want, it is, I would think, super fun to, to be real specific and really kind of um, random about things that you want. I would like some oddly colored animals, some unnaturally colored animals. Why not? If you can afford them, look for them and have other people on the lookout for them too, like Pink Bear. Really a very simple piece. This does have a very sort of Native American look for me, just in the stance, right? It's a very sort of uh, natural stance, kind of looking down, browsing, whatever there is to eat. Uh, very, very simple, very simple colors, a lot of running out of colors. You can see that the outline was done first and they worked from the outside in. They probably hoped against hope that somehow there would be enough pink to do the pink bear in one color. But, you know, as luck has it for us years later, it does look fantastic with multicolored. It looks almost like a cross-section of body parts, right, because of the color. But nonetheless, we see exactly what's going on. The background also, there's some um, running out of color problem. And I like that it happens right behind the bear's head. It's almost like a, like a streak of light, of dawn, uh, right behind the animal. And the placement of the eye and the mouth is very good in the center of the ear, right? It, Got, he's got a little bit of a hump in his back, but he doesn't look like a grizzly. It's not that much of a hump. It's really well done. Simple details there. The definition between the toes, those little black lines, really charming, really charming. Very simple and folky piece. Like this one, Two Eagles, 1880, cotton and wool rag on burlap, 43 by 38, found near Albany, New York. Uh, lots of times that it was exhibited. Some really cool things going on in this piece too. We've got a repeat of eagle. So somebody drew an eagle well and thought, let's do another one of those, right? Let's do two of those to fill this space. And then diagonal border, that's a real go-to, isn't it? The diagonal border on this is pretty perfect, right? You see the breaks at the corner. There's, there's really no mistakes. Somebody planned this out carefully. Um, a, a little bit of color change on the eagle on the right. Looks like somebody ran out, fantastic kind of um, thing, what I call these flowers in the corners finger flowers. Um, probably everybody has a different name for them, but I like the finger flowers in the corner. Very simple and folky. And I love that weird blue scroll at the bottom. It's different. It's like there's a little bit of room left over. Um, what, what other kind of motif could I add to the composition to make it a bit more full and fluffy? Let's do a scroll, right? Here comes the scroll. It really is charming, and it's very patriotic looking, too. This would be a very fun one to do, right? This would be a fun one to do for July. So coming up here now, um, a lion. We see a lot of lions. Um, th this is actually a two-part, so I'll show you the other half in a minute. 1900 cotton uh, and jute on burlap, found in Connecticut. This is an adaptation of a, the very popular and famous, even then, Ebenezer Ross pattern. This isn't his pattern, but somebody saw it and wanted to copy it. it. There's also a note that says burlap is made from jute and rug makers sometimes unraveled and used the jute when no other material was available. In this case, however, it was perfect. It was the perfect color for the lions. So they actually unraveled and used jute for the lions. It looked like they also used it on the top of the flower fence motif. So this is the left-hand side of this piece, and this is the right-hand side. I tipped it the wrong way. You know what? I'm not going to fool with it because I'm scared, but it's basically exactly the same. It's a mirror image of this one. Sorry about that. But isn't it interesting to know that the Ebenezer Ross pattern was so well known at that time that people were copying it, just as you would expect, and there would not have been a copyright issue with that at that time. Now, this piece, uh, also a very familiar piece because it's an Edward Sands Frost Spaniel. So this is a commercial pattern. This actually is the pattern, right? Unlike the Ebenezer Ross, somebody copied that. This is the pattern. It's called Best Friend, 1870, wool rag on burlap, braided wool border, 67 by 38, bequest from a New Jersey estate. That's all we know about this piece. This I've seen this piece many times, not, not like maybe for sale once, but I've seen it many times online. I've never seen it done this well. And you know, the spaniel in this design always has these like, uh-oh, there's something wrong, eyeballs, right? I don't know what it is, like he sees something over your shoulder. He always has crazy eyeballs. 
but it is a beautifully done dog. I love the patchwork, just like with the two MAD cats earlier, right? Two slides earlier. I love the diagonal patchwork, but look at this beautiful background. These flowers done so well. A lot of the flowers were dropped in this piece and in place a lot of marble cake, a lot of hit or miss. And it does mellow the piece so, so well and so nicely and gives a lot of weight and importance to that central motif that has so much uh, geometry happening. It has some shading going on. The little lines on the chest, the longer fur on the chest, the curve of the hip and that soft tail tucked under. It really, zombie dog, absolutely. Oh my God, it is. It's the night of the living dead. Um, but so charming, so charming. The color change in this piece is exquisite and the braid is exquisite. Look at this braid. There really is no color change. Somebody had enough material to do that much braid without seeing, I, I'm not seeing color change at all. Maybe you do, but I, I'm not. And I think that's extraordinary because if you've done braiding, you know that takes a lot of material. But they did have enough. The spaniel sees the horse, Tara. Uh-oh. Uh, they've got their own dialogue going on. It is so um, it is so fun to see something like this because I don't know what the situation is in the background. If the person loved doing the kind of echoing the motif of the flowers, trying to drop the flowers into the background so that the, the dog really is the story. But it is a very mellow background behind the dog. And then to find, for your eye to find its way to this beautiful braided border, it's just exquisite. It's just exquisite. 1870, a very early rug. Extraordinary and so well done. Another, a little bit newer at 1910, this one is called Button Eyes. Wool yarn, I keep hitting, there's a wire attached to my table here. Wool yarn, cotton rag rug on burlap, and buttons. So he actually has buttons for the button eyes, hence the name Button Eyes. 1910, found in Ohio. Um, I mean, what can one say about this rug? It's just gorgeous. It's just gorgeous, a very natural sort of oversized shape, right? He's very sort of awkward shape, but it is the way a dog would stand. Even the little toes, even the little fur coming off of the little elbows, right? And that little shaggy tail, it's just gorgeous. The suggestion of those fold down ears, those floppy little white ears, a little bit different. The definition of the snout, that triangle that, that serves as the tongue and the little black nose, it's perfect. It's just perfect. And then what else is going on here? An antique black background. Somebody had a lot of dark material. It worked real well for them to have that lovely black background. And then they did that very traditional for this time, lamb's tongue corners, right? They bracketed off the corners with the sort of hit or miss lamb's tongue. And then the addition of one more lamb's tongue over the dog's back. Because you know someone was sitting there and thinking, agonizing, right? You can see it because you've, you've been there before. Ah, oh, there's just too much background. There's too much background. What to do? And they drop in one more little lonely lamb's tongue right over the dog's back to kill some of that space. Uh, looks like a Newfoundland. It does look like a Newfoundland. Such a cutie. I mean, he's just so cute, isn't he? I'm going to skip quickly over the Magdalena Domestic Zoo because as much as we love this rug, and you know how I feel about Magdalena, 1870, uh, Magdalena Briner, E.B., we talk about her a lot. We've talked about this rug a lot. We will talk about it again. But I have a lot of other rugs that I want to show you. So I just want you to know that this was in its in Barbara's lifetime in her collection, uh, and it has since changed hands, and we've covered that part of the story. 1900, this is one of my favorite folky pieces ever. Hooked sun. Now this sun has so much going on. It almost looks like a rainbow, doesn't it? Don't you love this kind of top dusty rose background? Nufi or Pyrenees? Yep, absolutely. I love the white outlining. You just don't see that light outlining in rugs from this era. It's so unusual. They must have had, they must have had white. Um, a lot of the brown, which you would expect, right? Work clothes were brown. I just love this piece. Wool rag on burlap, 45 by 25 and a half, made in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania by Mennonites. Now, of course, this is the sort of neck of the woods of, for Magdalena Briner E.B. as well. Um, and she handled her farmyards and her animals a little bit differently, putting in a central motif like the lollipop tree. 
something or a, a large animal and then a lot of animals around it that were sized completely wrong. This is much more symbol driven and I'm so curious and excited about this. Is this some kind of a rebus or something? Tree sheep, tree lamb, bow tree lamb, bow tree lamb, bow tree lamb house. Could this be bow tree lamb or bow tree sheep, bow tree sheep house, bow tree lamb house? I don't know. It could be a rebus because I'm seeing that plus. Um, which And we know, going back to Longfellow, the poet Longfellow was one of the most famous and original rebus writers. He did so many rebuses in his lifetime in his publication. Um, oh God, what was that called? doesn't matter, I guess. But he published um, a, a periodical that always included rebuses, and he had such puzzling. Rebuses are picture puzzles. So when you see that plus, it makes me want to combine tree, tree sheep, uh, bow tree. Bow tree sounds okay. This could be something that involves research, right? I haven't, haven't done it. So interesting because it looks like it wants us to read across it. It's such a, it's such a, it's such a puzzlement. Beautiful little garden on the bottom. Love the little marble cake, little slice of pound cake in there, right? With these real pinwheel flowers sticking up. Very alert, very alert flowers. I like the black sheep. I like the dog. These just could be animals that live here. Little fenced in area. That bow is what's really throwing me. That's what's making me feel like we're supposed to be reading it instead of looking at it. These hookers were artists, absolutely, Barb. I mean, it's just so crazy, isn't it? That tree looks like a big cattail back there by the house, doesn't it? Look at that tweedy little path making its way up to the door. So inviting. It's not just leading you to the house, it's leading you to the door of the house. Welcome, welcome to this little house. What a beautiful composition. Kind of running out of uh, colors in the background here. Uh, the dog, it could be a collie. I know you have a collie, Kaz. So pretty the way that the animals are outlined. And then we've got the bird on the right. Looks like a bit of a morning dove. He seems to be on some kind of a post or pedestal. He could be a pet. Um, he seems to be on some kind of formal branch, doesn't he? And he's got all kinds of vines and berries above him. How cozy is that for him to just reach up and be able to take some, some berries and to eat them? I mean, it's such a charming, comfortable, friendly rug butterfly up on top there was a little bit of space up there above the chimney and the in the cattail tree little butterfly they've even done outlining in white on that house isn't it exquisite isn't it really something this rug doesn't it bring up all kinds of questions for you it really does me um karen says the only structure in this is that little cross that defines the lateral middle and the perpendicular third yeah i mean it it, it is a bit for me this is a bit of a toss like they're just putting elements in. The animals, for the most part, are okay for me. The dog and the sheep being a similar scale are okay for me. The butterfly is quite big. The bird is a little big. But then again, he seems to be close to us. The house in the distance is good perspective. Um, it, it has a lot going on. That sun is a huge part of the motif. They must have had colors, and the sun was important. And, of course, if you're a farmer, the sun is important. But for some reason, it was very important for them to to make this much of a design feature of the sun and knowing that the colors would be unnatural colors, they were okay with that. And they still wanted to press and make the sun this important in the motif. It's a curiosity. I think we should come back to this one again in the future because it really is so different. We could spend a whole episode speculating, looking, thinking. Um, it, do it doesn't remind me of any other rug I've ever seen. If it does you, let me know. It really doesn't. Look at the tree on the left, how well the shaping is done on that, just bringing in those light lines. They were worried that, that all of these elements that are sitting very flat in the composition would fall into the background, and that's why they did so much outlining. Um, they were worried about that, and they needn't have been because everything stands out beautifully, beautifully. I, I absolutely love that piece. Something different. This is called Quilting Bee, 1895, cotton and wool on burlap, 38 by 17, found in New Hampshire. Um, this is just so sweet. These women sitting at Quilting Bee, sitting on this very large frame. They've got what looks like either a patchwork or an album quilt happening. They're each working different parts of it. There's so much information here. The crossed guns over the mantle, beautiful landscape over the mantle. There is a hearth rug in place. Someone is um, who looks to have dark hair, not like an elderly person, is instead of working, relaxing by the fire. And I guess why not? A couple of matching sconces. They look almost like those tin, the punched tin ones over the mantle. 
Uh, we get a view out the window, right? We get a clue about where this house is set. The house looks like a shadow box. The perspective of these floorboards, not super well done, but giving it that extra folky punch. We get two windows uh, that help us know what's going on outside. And then weirdly, the picture over the mantle and the picture over the shelf between the two windows, they are the same kinds of colors as what's happening outside. So I guess that's our clue that these are like landscapes, right? And then another matched pair of candle holders or sconces um, next to the beautiful grandfather clock. And here are three lovely, what are probably braided rugs, um, in contrast to the rectangle rug in front of the fireplace, and all of these ladies sitting and working. I mean, it's just so endearing. It's got so much happening, and it is a little window into time. What's the name of this piece? This piece is called Quilting Bee, and Barb, the one before with that wild sun was called Hooked Sun. So Quilting Bee, I, my favorite part of this composition is that central figure, Happy Cocktail Night. I'm doing cheers, my dears, with you. Taking a sip. Mm. I love that dark figure that's behind the frame who's facing us with a dark dress. She's got her hand kind of raised like she's taking a stitch. She's very well done. Some of the others, there's a big cluster of ladies on the right that are not reading as well. And then there's some single ladies kind of around the frame. But that one lady... Um, with a dark costume on. She's giving me the most information in terms of what my eye can read. And she looks very natural in this pose of lifting her hand to sew. It's just an exquisite piece, isn't it? It's just gorgeous. I would be very surprised if this piece was not based on a needlepoint, wouldn't you? I mean, when you think about it, you see this kind of work done in cruel long stitch, uh, done in all forms of needlework and needlepoint, you rarely see this complicated of a pattern and this subject done in a hooked rug. So this makes it a real standout piece and I could see why she would want it for her collection. I've never seen this before and I have no reason to think that this is a commercial pattern. It could be a moment in time at this house, but I do think it's heavily inspired by, if anything, something that was done with a needle before it. I would be real surprised if it weren't. If we find that piece, I'll be a feather in our hats, right? Feather in the cap time. Now, here's another real personal looking piece that I can't imagine could possibly be a commercial design. It's called Our Town, 1930, cotton chenille yarn on burlap. Measures 46 by 26, made by Mrs. Turnley, a Mennonite in LaGrange County, Indiana. So absolutely beautiful piece. We see some kind of industrial building in the back, a tank and some kind of a mill a bit of black smoke coming out, an airplane in the sky, lots of hat tips to technology kind of encroaching. Uh, this is my interpretation, right? I don't know because there's nothing else written. But it looks to me like a technology encroaching on a very pastoral scene, right? And this is a Mennonite subject for sure because we've got corner of the world where we're seeing some little old houses that are bundled together in a community setting, beautiful, mature trees growing up from the center. We see some farm life happening. But... In the back of the picture, we see these references to trucks, cars, factory, modern times. And in the front sort of foreground, almost in the border, more cars. Cutting right through the middle is a black car uh, that's right near a sort of old farm wagon. Now, interesting, isn't it? Because it, it does, for me, this reads like some kind of a, um, a, a, some, a statement. Somebody's making a statement as sort of narration on modern times. Our town. Um, I don't know anything about it doesn't I don't know anything about Lagrange, uh, Indiana. I have not been. I'd be curious to know in 1930 was that town undergoing some kind of an uncomfortable um, uh, reality check with with the old and the new uncomfortably sitting together. I would wonder that looking at this piece because it seems like the person who made it really went out of their way to show us both in the same composition. And maybe it is a celebration of the two worlds coming together. I don't, I, I can't possibly know, but it is curious, isn't it? It is an interesting piece. Let's come to our next piece here. I'm gonna wet my whistle one more time because if there is one rug that reminds me of Hooked Sun, it is this rug. So it is not from the same neck of the woods. This is called Fisherman's House, 1885. Cotton and wool rag on burlap, 41 and a half by 28 and a half, made in Baltimore, Maryland by um, Ebe or E-B-E-B-E, -E -E, 
wife of a fisherman. No, uh, s well, that could be the last name, Eve. So then no forename, right? No first name. Let me just take a sip while we take a gander. Interesting. So in this case, we have got a, again, some light outlining, odd, beautiful house, very solid house, right in the center of the composition. Here's the story. Little steps leading to both doors. You hardly ever see that light on inside and smoke coming out of both chimneys. Isn't that friendly and cheerful? It's very welcoming, isn't it? I like these references to different motifs. We've got like a farm reference with the chicken in the bottom left. We've got a fish reference in the top left. We've got a knot, which could be like a Celtic knot, or it could be a marriage reference in the top right. Then we've got like the forest or tree on the bottom right that could also just be there, right? It could just be there. But there are at least two symbols in the sky that don't fit. Maybe the chicken just hangs out on the lawn and the tree is right next to the house, but we do have at least two symbols in the sky that, to use the word of the night, are curious. That's what makes these rugs great and different. I'm guessing that the knot on the right was red like the roof at one point because they both shaded, uh, faded kind of equally. This background is just to die for in my mind. It's almost like they, I, we don't know what the fade situation is looking at this photo. It's almost like they knew there was not nearly enough material color-wise to be consistent with the back. Um, and for whatever reason, they broke it up into blocks. Now, they knew they would be dropping a fish into the sky, so um, they blocked that out. And I think that is a really interesting design choice. They went very fluidly and organically around that little fire from the chimney, right around it. They didn't want to risk losing that story about it being cozy inside. So they went right around that softly, but they did block out that corner for the fish. And the fish is beautifully done. Look at his big fat lip and that little dark eye and the color changes. It's, it's so, the way that the fins are, it's perfect. I mean, it's really beautiful as opposed to the chicken, right? The chicken's kind of down there going, Baka! and the fish is up there in the sky looking pristine. It's just somebody who is better at drawing fish than chicken. That's all it is. That knot is another curious thing. It makes me think maybe it is a um, wedding rug. And why not? Maybe it was a happy couple and it was worth putting that like knot uh, motif in with their beautiful house that they obviously loved and loved living in. It just makes you feel good to look at a rug like this because it just, it's, it's, it speaks of happiness and coziness, doesn't it? Some things you look at and it's just like, isn't that austere? Isn't that a stoic looking house? Isn't that a fine and expensive looking house? This is just a happy house with symbols dropped in of things that were meaningful. Maybe they loved fishing. Maybe they lived on the water. And then the knot, whatever the knot means, it's very, very solid. And it almost always is a reference to love or being united in some way. So it's just a beautiful piece. It's another gorgeous piece to remake, isn't it? 1885. Now let's come over here to, now this one is obviously a lot newer, 1984. It's called Studio 75, Wool on Burlap, 49 by 31, made by the late artist George Wells. George Wells of Glenhead. Okay, so we know George Wells, right? Because he had, he, he was George Wells of Long Island, right? He um, was a very famous rug maker. We've done, remember the picture of him in the sand with the stick? Uh, drawing ideas for rug designs. We've covered George Wells quite a lot. Um, so I'm not going to go into crazy detail here, but let's revisit him soon because I also have one of his rugs that's a work in progress. He did beautiful work with yarn, right? With yarn. So this would have been a yarn. It says wool, but I'm sure that this is yarn. If you can see this close up, you can see all the little dit dots. This is yarn. This is not wool strips. Very cheerful Studio 74 portrait of Barbara Johnson's house with George, her tortoise, Mistletoe and Dippy, her cats. Mistletoe and Dippy. And a whale in the sky. Oh my gosh, you see the whale above the house on the left? A whale in the sky, commissioned for her as a gift. Well, that's extraordinary. I was going to say, this is one of those uh, rugs that I was just referring to that it doesn't do a ton for me because it is very, here's an expensive house. But now that I know that George Wells did this piece and that it was commissioned by Barbara and that Mistletoe and Dippy are in it, and George the tortoise, it means a lot more to me. That whale in the sky is just like, does me in. This is just such a good story rug. 
um, aquarium. Maybe, Karen, maybe. The last rug. This is a beautiful house. I mean, this is a very, very, very beautiful house. The stonework is handled beautifully. The shading on the trees, obviously a much newer rug, but it was important enough for her to have a rug by George Wells. I mean, it would be, right? If you could afford it, you would have you would have wanted it. I love the daffies on the right, the tulips on the left. Um, it's just, it's such a dear and personal piece, isn't it? So, so charming and absolutely a one of a kind. So oh, I'm glad we saw that. I'm glad we read that because um, that wasn't my favorite of the book. But now that I know that that was actually her house with her pets, it's even, it's very special. This one much older, 1890 Peacock on the Pump House. Um, cotton and wool rag on burlap, 73 by 28. Um, found in Maryland, traditional scene made by a group of Mennonite women in a hooking society. How interesting is that? A hooking society. Mennonite women in a hooking society. Isn't that fantastic? We see this a lot in rugs from this era. So what, what's going on here? Let's first look at the inner border, inside the border, which is the story. Let, let's first look at the outer border. This is a very typical sort of Mennonite style border. It, it resembles a lot of styles of quilt making, right? Borders and quilt making. Not so much for Mennonites, but in general, we see this a lot. We see this very soft scrolling kind of vine with flowers coming out at intervals that are color coded in a very uh, predictable and stable way because they want the border to be decorative and lovely, but they want the story to be in the center of the rug and they want that's where they really want you to look. So reading left to right, we're looking at the story and we're seeing immediately some of the true tropes um, of folk art. We're seeing animals that outsize buildings, right? So this is one of these things with folk art, lack of perspective, lack of proportion, things that we look for uh, because they're meaningful, right? This, these are things that we like to see in folk art, particularly of a piece of this age, 1890. Huge flowers, huge, very sort of contrived um, formation of flowers on the left, right? So when we talk about get your stems in first, this is a great example of get your stems in first. They want to give you height, like it's maybe a meadow, that kind of thing, or just a wildflower garden. They only want to show you a few flowers, so they have to be very careful about the way that they create the composition. It's very static. It's very silhouette-driven, isn't it? It's not like we see overlap happening. We just see overlap of stems. It's almost like a cutout. works very well for a folky piece like this that is not going to attempt to shade. And then we see the pump house itself with the pump and with this enormous uh, peacock on top. Unexpected, but really lovely. And then to the right, the house, right? And the house could be in the distance, but that still is a damn big peacock, isn't it? A cheerful house we've got here outlined in white, right? There are not that many rugs from this period that are outlined in, wh in white, but Barbara Johnson had quite a few of them. Chimneys outlined in red, right? It gives us a bit of a brick feeling. And the, the windows are outlined in red, very unexpected. Um, little little plume of smoke coming out of that chimney. I mean, isn't that sweet? It, it gives you such a feeling of coziness, but it also gives you the feeling that economically these people are fine because they can afford to have a fire, right? So if you can afford to have a fire, you're probably warm and full, right? You've cooked, you've cooked, you've used your fire to cook. It, all these little symbols that don't mean much to us now, they did mean stuff in the 1890s. And then moving to the right, we've got a lot of little flowers just sticking up individually from the ground. So cute, a basket under the tree. Doesn't look like an apple tree or something. It looks like maybe somebody's about to collect flowers. And then we've got a pedestal or a column with some flowers on top and then another basket or pot on the right with more flowers. So this is a real uh, horizontal mashup of motifs. So you can almost see the clockwork going in someone's head. Okay, I want the house in the middle, and the pump house is right outside, so let's get that in there. The peacock is very, very exotic. You, you never know, maybe they had a peacock. Let's get the peacock in the mix. And then what else am I gonna do? Well, there's a tree out there, let's get the tree in. There's definitely flowers. Let's get as many flowers as possible. And you can almost see that they were kind of planning and probably sketching onto the backing. Okay, one more pot of flowers. Well, that's a lot of room under the tree. How about a basket? Let's get a basket going. So you can see how once the house was in and the pump house was in, 
I'd be very surprised if the sort of MO was not at that point to fill in the rest. How about another pot? How about another basket? Because that's what makes sense, right? That's what makes sense. And that's why these early folk compositions are so charming and so much fun to look at and to read um, because people were working in that manner and they were working in that kind of chronology. It was like, let's get the most important stuff done and then we'll think about the rest later. And, and for that reason, we're able to read these early pieces like a book. And that is part of the fun and the joy. Now, unexpected. We know this piece. It's called Philadelphia. Um, it's not really called Philadelphia. It's called uh, Ben Franklin is a Boy. I'll show you the piece in a minute. 1875, wool and cotton rag on burlap. Um, I'm questioning 1875, but we'll come back to that. 62 by 39 and a half inches, made in Philadelphia. Uh, covered bridge in the background was built across the um, Schoil Kill River at Market Street, uh, 18, sorry, 1798 to 1806. Okay, there is a covered bridge in the background. That might not be original. Keep your eyes on this picture for a minute while we look. Um, apparently, that covered bridge burned in 1875. Okay, so with that in mind, let's think about this. Now, this is another mystery wrapped in an enigma, like a Russian nesting doll of, uh, of mysteries here. So I'm going to show you the commercial pattern that this is based on in just a minute. Let's look at these elements. I haven't done this yet. I'm doing this with you now. This is a known piece, and um, not Ebenezer Ross, um, Ralph Burnham. Ralph Burnham made, made this into a commercial pattern. Let's look at the commercial pattern, and then let's come back. So let's come up here. And wait a minute. Oh, you know what? It's in a different, hang on. Hello. It's in, I put it in the wrong window. It's here. <coughs> okay. In interesting. So we're getting some of our answers. I was wondering if those doors that opened to the basement on the right were there. They are. This is from the Ralph Burnham catalog. So this is the design, the way that he printed it. He was very stencil driven in the way he created patterns to hook. That covered bridge is in there. So this is all pretty accurate, isn't it? Look at the shadows. In this, in the drawing, you can really see the shadows of the houses in the street, right? You see almost like their reflection on there. So this is the pattern itself. Let me get rid of that. Let's come back over here. I'm going to come back to, what was it? Um, 46, I think it was this one. Yeah. Um, the person who hooked this obviously took out the shadows of the house. That's why they don't look familiar. The brick is really well done really well done so th this is uh, these are my thoughts on this piece remember how ralph burnham i'm going to come back to you for a minute remember how ralph burnham of marblehead was the one in the 20th century like the 1930s to start he had an antique store and he would take people's rugs in and he would copy them and literally thus pull the pattern off of them not physically just take the pattern from them and start selling the pattern. So he would repair rugs and he would borrow, take um, the actual pattern off these old rugs. So it could well be that this is quite an old rug and it is indeed an 1875 rug that he crossed his path and went through his store that he peeled the pattern off of and turned it into a commercial pattern. Because, we, because if it were an original pattern that he made, we cannot make it 19th century because he's not 19th century. So I'm going to have to assume, so far this book has been very good in terms of accuracy. I'm going to assume that 1875 is okay. And if that's the case, that means that this is what this is one of the rugs that Ralph Burnham had in his store that he peeled the pattern off of. And if he did that, it would follow that somebody added the reflection, almost like it's dusk or early morning, of those houses onto the street. Who knows? But because those houses aren't there, it makes me a bit uncomfortable because I'm thinking, why would you take away such, such a charming element to put in just one more stripe of brown? I don't know the answers to these questions. I don't. We would have to take a real survey of all of this rug for Ralph Burden was called Benjamin Franklin as a boy. 
it is interesting, Lynn, isn't it? Because it's posing, it's posing some um, real questions um, in terms of timeline. These are not questions we need to answer tonight, but I think these are the kinds of things that are interesting to kick around together because we all know different things and we've all seen different things. But there does seem to be a, a bit of a year thing here for me because if this rug is the earliest version of this image, that would mean that Ralph Burnham added the reflection of those houses. And I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm not going to say it doesn't seem like something he would do. He was a big copyist, but not such a um, forthcoming original artist. I don't know. I said it, but I don't know. Mm. Love the beer. All right. Changed my mind completely. I absolutely love the beer. So let's come away from this one. We'll keep our secret thoughts. It's something. Hey, if you wake up at 315 tonight, God forbid. That's something to think about. Don't think about the big things. Don't think about those big heavy things that get you at 315. Think about the Ben Franklin rug and see if that can get you back to sleep. Count the bricks on the wall, right? Now, here's another one that we've seen before. General Washington, 1890, wool on burlap, found in Richmond, Virginia, 52 and a half by 29. This has been copied so much in the 20th century that it's like, I, I have no idea. I have no idea if this is the earliest version if it is 1890, it likely is. But this is another one that people are still copying today. And why not, right? It's it's so old that n nobody owns the right to this image anymore. They own the right to the photograph of this image, but not the drawing itself. So it's very hard to comment on this one because we've seen it so many times. But it is so lovely. His house, his horse, his cherry tree, and him. Um, really beautiful. Look at this very sort of Bargello sky. Also, the ground is very Bargello. It's almost like it's pulled thread, isn't it? Look at the handling of that. Well, that must be Mount Vernon, right? Monticello, Mount Vernon. That must be Mount Vernon on the left, right, his house. And then behind it, the cherry tree branches. But that beautiful green tree is very odd. Look at the coloring on that beautiful green tree. It is so different, right? I mean, look at the way that the green breaks down. It's very unexpected love the horse. The horse is really sweet, isn't it? It's got its little um, leg. It looks like it's crossed, but it's probably up. We could use a bit of a shoulder line. I love that blanket over its back. And again, when the eyes and the nostrils are right, a horse can be so good. Sorry, Tara. It can be. And I like the way that the black is sweeping away. It's a beautiful horse head, isn't it? It almost reminds me like of a cattle skull, which means it's right. It, it just looks right. Not so much the leg, the front leg. But it just looks right. There's George Washington uh, with his wig sitting in a very um, um, big and important chair, right? It's not at all the kind of thing he would have really sat in. Uh, the man who turned down the, the chance to be the king, right? He would not have sat. He did, his furniture didn't look like this. But it is grand, and that's the point, isn't it? Um, it really is a beautiful piece. The background for me is the most interesting part of this piece. Of, look at the way that the text is, is, text is handled, particularly on the bottom. The color changing behind some of that text to that lighter color is so smart. It's so smart. I mean, for a rug of this age, assuming it, it is indeed 1890, it is, it is beautifully done. But we have seen this image a lot, so I'm going to move on. Something that we can talk about and think about in the future. Spirit of St. Louis, 1927. Cotton on burlap, 45 by 32 and a half, purchased in New York. This is Lucky Lindy's plane, Charles Lindbergh's plane. What a beautiful original composition. It is so different. So much of one color. It looks almost like a military color in the background, doesn't it? Like army, army clothing cut up in the background, unless it's dyed. In the foreground, well, not foreground, up in the air, beautiful silhouette. Like a, a really um, lovely loose line drawing of the plane. It is so different. It is so charming. It is so minimalist. And there is something absolutely beautiful about it being so high up in the composition. Because wouldn't you expect to see it smack in the middle? And it's not. It's up there. It's like celebrating that trip before the ticker tape parade and everything that happened to celebrate afterward. Look at the amount of care and trouble it took to write Spirit of St. Louis on that thing. That is so cool. Some of it is a bit clunky, right? It, it looks almost like a pen and ink drawing, but it's just, it's so um, personal. It's so loose and pretty. It tells a story. Um, and I do think that's a military sort of uniform color in the background. That tells an extra story if that is the case. 
It's just a beautiful piece. Very, very different. Another beautiful piece. This is called, expectedly, The Lark, 1872, cotton and wool on burlap, 63 by 30 and a half, found on Nantucket, Mass. We know Barbara found a lot of rugs on Nantucket, Mass. Um, a very specific boat. Um, you know, the, the handling of the background is so different. It almost looks like the rigging is like cobwebs. I love it. I love it. These are really abbreviated sails. If I knew more about boats, I'd be able to say what kind of boat this is based on the sails. I love the background. Is it sky? Is it water? Who cares? It's all cut up. It's all hit or missy blues and tans and light colors. It's so pretty. Even the sails of the boat, so pretty. The outlining of this one, it, it, it has so much charm, doesn't it? So folky. You could see this hanging up on a wall. How stellar would it be to have this hanging up on the wall? Um, the dimensions are very golden rectangle, aren't they? It's a very fat rectangle heading toward a square. Very different piece. S super charming, super nautical, and not surprising that it was found on Nantucket. Um, another really charming one, a very boxy oval, the house cat, 1920, wool and rayon on burlap, uh, 32 by 28 and a half. So not an enormous one found in Pennsylvania. Somebody had a piece of backing and this is what they did with it. The cat and their house. Another very charming and welcoming path leading right through that little front gate, past the little flowers that are growing right to the door, which looks open. Welcome. Come on in. And it's sort of a reference to more of a farm building or farm buildings in the background. Beautiful tweed making up the sky. I love these skeletal sort of wintry trees with a sort of red um, winter sun in the background, right? It's kind of, it, there seems to be some references to winter, but then there's flowers growing, so maybe not. So different, so folky. That cat is a hot mess, which makes him delicious and wonderful, doesn't it? So sweet. I love the shaped out yard too. There's a, there's a real effort to make that grassy yard different than the dirt path that leads to the other buildings on the property. But I love seeing those uh, trees kind of floating in the air. I love the, they, they really wanted to use that patterned material in the sky and they wanted to put clouds in too, but they seem to have been loving what they were doing in the sky. It must have just been flowing in such a satisfying way that it was kind of like, oh, I was going to put clouds in the sky. And they dropped the clouds in behind the lines of the sky that are meant to be solid. So it creates a really interesting look. The, the clouds tend to be blocked out because it's almost like an afterthought that they were added. Super sweet. Very different. Very charming. Now this next one, um, man in sheep drawn cart. Okay, so this is not the man in sheep drawn cart we looked at last Wednesday. This is different. This is a real original man in sheep drawn cart. Um, there is more of like a McGowan era man in sheep drawn cart. This is definitely not it. 1900 cotton and wool rag on burlap, um, a regular oval, 24 by 19, purchased in New York. This is the first rag rug that Barbara Johnson picked up. We, we made a reference to this uh, during the week. So really lovely, very simple, super folky. So if this is the first rug she picked up, you can be sure that um, this was her style, right? She really liked the folk hooked rugs. And that's why there's so many present in her collection that we're seeing. Of course, her, her tastes, I, I wouldn't say change, but she picks up more contemporary rugs um, in the 70s and 80s. But her true love and her first love seems to be these very folky rugs. Is it a, a, a horse? Is it a dog? It's, I mean, I hope it's a horse, but it's very hard to tell, isn't it? They've done some things, and the silhouette of the person is just fine, and the wheel is beautiful. It is a clunky piece, and it does have that folk charm, little yellow sun burning in the background. And then we move into looking at Hutchinson rugs, like the elopement, one of the Hutchinson's favorite subjects. So beautiful, but we do cover the Hutchinson's on other episodes, and I want to cover them again. So let's, let's look at this rug and other lovely Hutchinson rugs like this one. I love my good man with a tender devotion, but I can, but I cannot go his kin. I cannot, but I cannot go his kin. Hmm. That doesn't flow, does it? Um, but it is lovely. And there's so much happening in this rug with expressions and with patterned material. Let's talk about the Hutchinson's another time. That is a whole, uh, many conversations separate. 
Now, this is the piece I used for the thumbnail, I think, on Wednesday. This is called The Hunt, 1920. It certainly does have that deco feel, doesn't it? It looks like a tapestry or a screen, like a room divider. Uh, wool yarn on burlap, 120 by 82 and a half, found in Bernardsville, New Jersey. Really beautiful. I mean, elegant costume touches, right? I love the sort of joppers going down to the boot, very nondescript, the hat very nondescript, a lot of attention giving, given to the lines of the red riding coat. Really lovely. The spotted horse. Look at the position of the tail. Look at the, the dogs falling into the background. Almost has the colors of a cave painting. We know that it's not. There's probably some fading here, but that rush of dogs creates a pattern, more than a composition. It looks more like a pattern. The main subject is in the front, and they've dropped dogs, dogs, dogs into the background, all facing the same way. Very similar. It could just be traced. It could be a piece of paper traced again and again. And then instead of doing sort of directional hooking in the background, they have broken up the background in between the dog's bodies, and they end up boxing out the background in that manner, right? But look at the dog that's immediately under the horse. I mean, the dogs are done so well. And the horse is done too. You get such a feeling of motion. You also see a great um, attempt at, and, and I'm not going to say attempt because it was successful, sh shadows, right? The horse's legs, the backs of the horse's legs, they really understood the shadow. Um, there's also, you know, coloring or shadow on the horse's back. And then the dogs seem to all have that floppy ear that's a little bit darker, reminds you of ghost riders in the sky. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is ghostly because there's really no ground and none of nothing in this picture is grounded with no horizon line. We do get more of a toss or a pattern, um, but it really is. It's very anonymous, the blank face, right? It's very anonymous and the dogs are all the same. So they're anonymous too. It really is so different, isn't it? I'm going to keep going here because we have we have plenty more to look at and I don't want to rush. I really don't want to rush. So Adam and Eve, 1910, rayon on burlap, 29 by 22 and a half, made in New Jersey. The maker's initials were DFS, hooked into the bottom center of the rug. Again, what an example of a hit or miss background. I mean, this is just crazy. This is so pretty. And the fact that it was done in such warm colors, the sort of ochres, golds, olive greens. I mean, it's just beautiful. I love the way that the nudity is handled. I love nudity, but I love the, you know, his back. He looks so strong with his back and his little butt cheeks, the sort of swirl, paisley type swirl showing the definition of muscles, very manly. And she's very feminine. She's got lovely, big childbearing hips, nothing untoward about the way that the bodies are looking, right? really pretty, very neutral bust, very benign nudity here. The amount of detail in their faces is extraordinary. It's just a few lines, but in just the right places. And it's the moment where they're considering the apples, right? She's got it in her hand and she's thinking, this is a good idea. And that snake just waiting, focused on her and not him, because he's also holding an apple. But the snake very focused on her, and we know what happens next. But it really is a beautiful, very simple apple tree in this center. It looks almost like that sort of medic um, symbol. Very simple. And the tree almost disappears into this very lively hit or miss background. But it's not quite hit or miss, right? It has been thoughtfully done. It's very organic, the background. You see all this growth, all of this lush growth, all of this swirling activity. It is lively and it is lush. It gives all, all the right feeling off for the subject. It, it, it's an extraordinary piece. Oh, hey, Mom. Oh, my God, you had a busy day. Well, I'm glad you're there. I was, I was a little bit worried about you. Adam and Eve, such a beauty. So let's look at the last image of this book that's called Warm Friendship. And it says, Warm Friendship, like the golden sun, sheds kindly light on every one. Uh, rayon knits, so stretch material on burlap, 78 and a half by 45 and a half, found in Mohawk, New York. Now, this piece is just a stunning example of um, an early piece, isn't it? I mean, oh, wait a minute, did we have a year on this? I just shut our book. Yeah, 1920. You know, it looks even older than that. But this is someone who did not have a plan, ran out of space with the, with the text, but loved this passage and wanted to have these words down wrote these beautiful, uplifting, cheerful words, nice motto, right on the rug, outlined nicely, and then 
grabbed for the material and just started plugging it in. And it works well, doesn't it? It works so well. Um, you can see what colors they had handy. And you can see up at the top, they started doing kind of designy stuff. They're doing sort of the blocking kind of hit or miss in the background. They're not going all fluid and flowery like Adam and Eve. They're going just blocking it out. But long stretches of hit or miss, long stretches. And they had that feeling, I really need to keep the words against a dark ground so they pop. And so they did. They used their dark material behind the words. And then they, for the most part, ran out. It really creates a piece that has so much spontaneity. Um, and these kinds, of, these kinds of rugs are the ones that are so easy to picture someone working on. Just really, really naive, not in a patronizing way, naive in a valuable way. This is an exquisite rug. Wendy, thank you so much for sending me that, now I don't remember off the top of my head, I should have written it down, past issue of ATHA, Association of Traditional Rug Hooking Artists um, issue that showed one of the rugs that we'd been looking at on Monday, or I think it was Monday, um, and a project that people did got together as a group um, in ATHA to recreate the specific rug. So Wendy was kind enough, thank you so much, to send me the images of this ATHA because if I have to go rootling through my magazines, it just ain't going to happen. So I really appreciated uh, getting these images. I just want to show you the images that are in this issue. Um, hold on one second. I'm just, yep. So this is one, this is, I'm sorry, this is not the one that um, we were focused on this week from the Barbara Johnson collection, but this is a lovely example of a nice old rug, repeat pattern, right? So this is a horizontal repeat, beautiful color filling in the background. This is one of the rugs that was featured in this at the article. And this is one of the examples of it having been remade. Same flowers, contemporary remaking, translating, reinterpreting the exact same rug with, an, again, very color blocked background, a little bit of a different handling. Let me show you the original again in the border. And this is the fun of, I mean, the border is added, right? It's just not there in that one. This is the fun of reinterpreting beautiful old works. So that's what this issue was about. Here is the one that I just showed you a close-up of in the article, in the context of the article. So look on the bottom right. Do you see that rug? Because that is this rug, right? So we talked about this one on Monday. That is the original rug. So that's the Barbara Johnson rug that we're looking at and... Did I do that? Okay, here we go. Um, here's, okay, so this was written by Fritz Minnick. I wonder if Fritz Minnick is related to Polly Minnick, right? Who does a lot of the sort of nautical stuff now. Um, this is a, and I, I do want to get to you the exact article that this is, and I want to return to this article, um, maybe this coming week on Coffee Time, because looking at these contemporary interpretations of this particular old rug, the Barbara Johnson collection rug, this is exquisite, this interpretation. Look at the colors. It looks like the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It is exquisite. So this article was written by Fritz, F-R-I-T-Z, Minnick, and this is a picture of her here. We are going to talk more about this article. It is well worth talking more about. Um, more interpretations of the same rug, right? These, these are both different. So we're seeing versions that a lot of people have done of this rug. And if you remember on Monday, I happened to say, wouldn't it be cool to do this design? Well, somebody, no new ideas under the sun, right? Nothing new under the sun. Fritz Minnick already had this idea and it was done. And it was done beautifully in this issue of Atha. So again, down at the bottom, that is the original rug from the Barbara Johnson collection. And on top, another interpretation of it. How stunning. Absolutely beautiful. I want to look at this more. Wendy, thank you so much for sending this. I'm going to tie this into what we're doing in a minute um, also. So we're, going to, we're not going to end quite yet because I want to show you some of... Oh, no. Oh, here it is. I just scared myself. I want to show you some of the rugs that I found today. Just run through them briefly because these rugs are all on a website called First Dibs. And if you're not familiar with it, it can be ludicrously overpriced, insanely, laughingly overpriced. 
it doesn't change the fact that the people who have some of these rugs on here, are, they're having a good laugh with the price, but all the same, they have the rug, right? They have the, these, some of these very early rugs. This is the section where I want to say at the end of the episode tonight, let's look at some of the rugs that if Barbara Johnson were still alive, I honestly think she would be considering some of these rugs that we're about to look at. Let's look together at, I'm going to run through them. These are, again, all, all on first dibs. This is called simply Rare American Hooked Rug, $6,500. Absolutely beautiful. Not in my budget. Would have been in Barbara's budget. Uh, maybe it's in your budget. $6,500. Again, all of these are on first dibs. In terms, you know, half of this book was geometrics because Barbara loved geometrics. I bet she would be very interested in owning this rug. Here comes another one, Log Cabin, very similar to the one I started tonight's episode off with, except this is just the corner. Remember the light and shadow diagonal I showed you at the beginning? This is called Checkerboard Antique American Hook Drug with Geometric Designs, 2400 So it's a lot less, but I have to say, I have seen this rug, in, not this rug, I've seen this exact design in many antique stores for like 70 80 90 100 $200, $2,400 strikes me as a lot for this rug with no pedigree because the people who are putting these up, they really don't have information on these rugs. They just think that they can maybe get this price and they are one of a kind. So it's one of these good luck finding the exact same rug again. Thank you, Wendy. April, May, 2021, that issue of Atha. Thank you so much. It was a great example of playing with an old rug and it happened to be an old rug from the Barbara Johnson collection and doing new versions of it. Who doesn't love to see that in our world, right? This one is really, really stunning for me. American, sorry, Antique American Hooked Rug, uh, 7,800. So the checkerboard one, oh, I'm sorry. Nope, I'm, I'm sorry. This one's also ca called checker, Checkerboard Vintage American Hooked Rug with Geometric Cross Designs, $2,900. Um, another beautiful composition, very simple, certainly a homemade composition, very, very successful, $2,900, right? And again, we're not having a laugh. We're just looking at rugs that for people who are real collectors in this, in, in this price range, um, rugs that those people might like to collect. Now, this one is amazing. It's just called Antique American Hooked Rug. $7,840. So another one of these log cabin type rugs. It's obviously much larger. I don't have the measurements on it. I didn't immediately see them on the page. First Dibs is a tough web website to navigate, but if you put in hooked rugs, you will find um, like uh, over a thousand of them. And they're not all good, right? I'm, I peeled off the ones I thought were the best. $7,840. It really is stellar and it's large. It is fantastic. And I'm not saying that any of these rugs are not worth the money that's being asked for them. Um, I'm just saying that First Dibs is the kind of a website where people put routinely put high prices on things. And that's a bad start, isn't it? It's just a bad start because you have people selling who, who clearly do not know what they're selling, have not done the research into what they're selling, don't have provenance on what they're selling, but want to put a price tag on it that's like, hundred times more than what you would see it for in another place. Not a hundred, but like 50 times more in many cases. It's just, it's a bit frustrating. Now, this one is very different. This is called Antique American Hooked Rug. That's it. This is $480, but this is the main picture of it. There is not a picture of this. It's very different. And I think this one's well worth the money. Very original design. Um, no year on it. 480, not that much, but it is a cropped picture. And I could not see the edges of it, you know, on the on the page. Um, I didn't put all of the pictures from it because I just wanted to run through at the end of this episode. But I thought, yeah, yeah, that, that's a problem, isn't it? When you really can't see. I like this one too, Lynn. You really can't see the edges. So take a look at it if you want. Antique American Hooked Rug. If you go into First Dibs later, the website, just check under. Uh oh, wait a minute. I lost my place again. Just check under hook drugs or antique hook drugs and you're going to see all of these guys. Another beauty, right? This is, we, we've seen this design before. I don't know that it's a copy design. It's just an intuitive design, isn't it? Another 
It's called Antique American Hook Drug, $784. It's an absolutely beautiful rug. It is super beautiful. Um, it's exquisite. And it, it's not an extraordinary amount of money for this rug. You just want to check uh, this sort of pedigree, see where it's coming from, and make sure that there's a lot of photos if you're spending in the high hundreds or thousands. This one is called Antique American Hook Drug. So many of them are called Antique American Hook Drug. $1,504. This one looks to be, looking on the left, in not great condition. It is very different. There is a very naive scroll on the top and bottom. There is a very naive scroll on this side to side. At least I believe them all to be scrolls. But there is a very intricate border, um, which has me guessing and wondering, was this a commercial pattern that was handled a little bit inexpertly? I love the color change. I love the background. I love the border. I love the mystery that's associated with this piece. But there is a lot of color loss. $1,504. That's so unexpected, right? And it does have a cotton twill border around the edges. Um, you can see that. It's done in tan. So it is lovely, it is lovely, and it is different, and that's why we're looking at it. That is a heavy price tag. This one is just <clears throat> beautiful. Guess what it's called? Antique American Hook Drug. $544. I really like the breakdown of color on this. I really like the fact that it's a bright hit or miss. There is some color planning involved here. You can see with the placement of the tan and the placement of the salmon, really a lot of color planning involved, and all of the hit or miss is is done um, in the same direction. So it, it's very orderly to look at. For a hit or miss, it really is, um, it, it's beautiful, it's bright, and it's much more cheerful than most hit or miss rugs that we encounter. This is um, it, another one that's called Antique American Hook Drug, $784. This has such a cool feel to it, almost like a postage stamp composition, isn't it? Uh, lots of heavy borders within borders. I this this reminds me of a lot of latch hook designs, um, and if that's the case, then it is a mid twentieth century rug. I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to find this one on first dibs. But I thought the color placement was beautiful. It's very graphic, except for the handling of the flowers, which are very Japanese in feel, but they are dogwoods, right? Because they're notched. But it looks like a Japanese woodcut feel. Very unusual colors, the blue, the black. It's it's a lot of contrast. It's a very sort of feminine looking rug with a very graphic border. It's it's very different. For $784, this is a good rug. I, I would be happy to get a rug like this. It's it's got a lot going on. It's got a lot of big question marks attached to it. These are all off first dibs. Now, another homemade pattern for sure, not clamshells, but triangles that are done in the same sort of formation as clamshells. You're just pushing the corner of your postcard up your page and making, making the right angle as you go. That's how this design was done. Creates kind of a herringbone, but you're able to do it in all your hit or miss scrappies. Um, this rug had a size. It's also called Antique American Hook Drug, two foot by seven uh, by four foot by six. $1,400. I think that is a good price for this. I think this is an early rug. I would be surprised if this were not like an 1880s era rug. Certainly done true to the hit or miss style. Certainly a homemade rug. I think this one is worth that kind of money. I'm not sure that they all are, but I feel that this one is. Um, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm out of order here. I missed one. How did I miss one? Hang on. Let me come back. Nope, we got to see this through because I had one more for you. Wait a minute. If I miss putting it in the slideshow, we're going to have to cover it on Monday morning and coffee time. I miss putting it into the slideshow. So we're going to have to cover it Monday morning for coffee time. So forget what you just saw. Scramble, right? Do brain scramble. So what I want to show you is this rug, right? We're going to talk about this again on Monday morning. Um, this is a hook drug that's on first dibs, uh, $6,500. Wow. It is lovely. It is a nice old rug. It is a very unusual design. This is a, this, this is an old rug. So what I did with this rug, take a good look at it. I gave this rug the name, um, uh, uh, per, per, what, Pearls Amongst the Swine. And because they look like pearls to me and the circles look like like pig snouts. So 
what I did for us for this weekend, if you have time, I, I'm, I'm flat out, but if you have time, what I did this weekend was a Wendy Atha special, right? In honor of Wendy sending me that Atha magazine. Look at this image. What I did was, I didn't take, I was stupid enough to not draw it. I put the, the downloadable pattern for that rug. I drew it, right? I drew it. So I drew it and I put a link to it on the ribbon candy hooking page in the description of this video tonight. And when you click on it, ribbon candy hooking, I also gave you an idea for colors. Don't use my colors, use whatever colors you like. But I thought, does anybody in our group want to fool around with a very old rug, uh, pearls, pearls amongst the swine or among the swine? I forget exactly what I called it. Um, if you are interested in having this as a free, oh, Sally, that's such a bummer. Oh, classic, right? If you want to download this, this weekend or any weekend, it is permanently on the Ribbon Candy Hooking website for free. You can download it and resize it. How do you resize it? You download it, you put it on your printer to a certain size and it spits out however many papers it's going to take to make that size. And then you cut the margins off and scotch tape your papers together and then do whatever transfer method you use, whether it's fiber tape or red dot or light box or whatever you use. So. If you're interested in doing this, get going now or later or anytime. I will do it eventually, but it's a busy time for me with my vacation coming up. Um, but if you're interested in doing this kind of a challenge, I wanted to put a rug for you on tonight in honor of that Atha um, article that Wendy sent because it's a great idea to get together and make the same rug if you like it in whatever colors you want, whether it's true to the original whether it's like the one that I colored that is now on Ribbon Candy Hooking and the link is right here. I'll also put it on our Facebook page, which is Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. So it'll be it'll be there too as soon as I log off. So if you want to download and do it, do it. Absolutely. Something fun to hook for the weekend, right? Or not for the weekend. It'll take some time. But you can make it small and do it in mini punch. You can make it really large. You could make it really, really large. But what a beautiful composition it is. Per pearls before the swine, I think. Um, yeah, see if you, you could do pearls and clamshells. Absolutely. However you want to do it. It's an old rug that I believe to be a uh, 19th century rug, just with circles, circles within circles, right? Simple design, um, with the circles in between. And when they're white, they really do look like pearls, but do it however you like in rows, such a simple composition. So easy, so much fun. It'd be so nice if a bunch of people took it up and we're all working on it kind of at the same time and enjoying ourselves at the same time with a project like that. I thought it's there for you. I'll remind you again on Monday that it's there for you because it's just fun to have another project to work on. So let me project forward. I also put the swatch set, the new swatch set that I did, the two links to that in the body of this video as well under the description. So that's Songs of a Summer Night, two different links, one for the swatch set, which comes with the um, mystery pattern, which is one of the geometrics from Monday's Barbara Johnson episode, right? It comes with that for you to transfer and make right away. The swatch set is different than the individual colors because the swatch set is all of those colors are sold individually. So if you click on and you want the swatch set, make sure you're clicked onto the swatch set for songs of this of a summer night or click on the other link and then you can look at yardage for each of the individual colors. I just want to remind you coming up, I have a vacation and I take a long vacation this time of year, every year. Um, and we always have, we're going to be going away. My last day is going to be Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we're taking the kids, me, my mom, my family, uh, my sister, her husband, all of us taking off for Cape Cod. We sneak out two days early so we don't hit that holiday traffic at the bridges. And we sneak two nights at it like a motel um, before we go to the house that we rent that's on a pond. Same one every year since I was a teeny little thing. And um, so that starts for me on Thursday. So next week for cocktail for coffee time, I'm going to be running episodes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then I'm on vacation for um, Thursday, Friday in the following two weeks. And I know that I will come to you during that time. I might do pre-recorded stuff. I anticipate having a connection problem with internet, but I will come to you. I'll be doing stuff. I'm certainly going to go to the Cranberry Guild um, rug hooking show 
on that first Saturday that I'm there. I will try to do a video. If I see people I know or I'm meeting people, I'll do a video for you that's live. Um, so I know I will be with you during that time, but I won't be having formal shows during that time because I remember that the internet is not okay. So let's not set ourselves up for disaster, but it will be a lovely vacation. You know that I will take photographs constantly of the different rugs that I see in different places and other textiles that are interesting for us. I'll be going to lots of flea markets and yard sales. I'll see what I can find and I will share all that information with you while I'm there so you have the chance if you want to, as people sometimes do, if I say I'm at this antique center and you love that rug, just call them up and say, do you ship, right? That happens all the time when I post stuff. People buy stuff by shopping vicariously. So be looking out for lots of posts for me on Facebook. I'll also put some blogs onto the blog page on Ribbon Candy Hooking so you can find me there and you know what I'm doing. But just remember that for me next week, I will run Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then Thursday at the crack of dawn, we're going to be bundling babies in the car and getting going for the Cape. So I don't know what the content will be for the week next week, but we will start by talking about this pattern. And I may even uh, transfer it onto backing for myself so I have it as like an alternate thing to do while I'm away. And I'll come up with some great episodes for us for next week before I take off. Um, so it won't be a complete drought. In the meantime, happy weekend. Look for those new things on ribbon candy hooking. Even though I'm going away, I'll let you know if you put in an order that's not in stock and ask you if you can wait for me to come back. I love having orders while I'm on vacation. I sound like I'm begging, but having no income for that time is scary for me. So feel free to get stuff and I'll just send you a reminder that I'll be fulfilling orders when I come back, but it is nice to see orders coming in. And again, thank you to Patreon members always. Um, I will be putting up some vintage rug patterns tomorrow um, that are available in the Facebook group. Um, so be looking for those too. If you're looking for some old vintage patterns, I have tons right now. So be looking for all of those things. I'll, I'll get as many things out as I can before it's time to blow. So um, that's coming up real soon. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun with our episode tonight. I'm going to go down and work on my Chagall. Remember, Design Like Chagall class is coming up. There's also a book contract in the mail for me. I'll be able to tell you that as soon as I sign it and return it. Uh, very exciting book project coming up that we are all going to be participating in, I hope. Uh, I hope that your special stamp and your special unique character and personality will be part of that book, just like the one I just finished. So I can tell you more about that hopefully this coming week. But that is that is all happening quickly. So that's a lot of fun for all of us. I will see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. If you need me, I am at ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. New things happening on the website, new things happening all over the place. But I will look forward to another episode of Coffee Time with you at noon Eastern Standard Time on Monday. Thank you to Patreon members. Look out for everything. Write me if you need me, and I will see you on Monday for Coffee Time. Happy weekend, everybody.